Okay, so I think we, I can start with the introduction. So uh, I'm Jula Pajak Tierney with Philadelphia Fed. And uh, so I, it is an honor to introduce this session. Can someone go and get more people in here? <laughs> <laughs> But do we do 40 minutes from when we start? Yeah. Uh, up. Yeah. Well, 40 minutes is what we were working on. So, yeah, and you can sort of warn me. So, so uh, it is an honor to introduce uh, the next session, FinTech Conversation with the OCC Controller. And um, so uh, I uh, wanted to point out that the FinTech proposal that we heard about earlier in the previous sessions. Uh, actually, it was, uh, the proposal was to issue this special purpose national bank charter to FinTech lenders, right? But that actually uh, happened under the previous controller. And uh, so there have been mixed responses and you heard about the lawsuits as well. So uh, I wanted to uh, be, so our speaker today, the acting controller, Keith Norega, actually uh, inherited that proposal when he took the office in May of 2017, this year. And so he has been talking about it, but today we will hear more about his own view related to this FinTech charter and uh, also other issues related to FinTech. So uh, prior to uh, joining the OCC, Nor uh, Controller Norega was a partner at a law firm, a pre prestigious law firm. And uh, so he was focusing on banking regulations and related litigation. And uh, so he advised to a wide range of financial institutions, both domestic and international, and uh, got his law degree Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School. Uh, interestingly, prior to that, he got his uh, bachelor degree from uh, the Wharton School in 1994. And it's almost 25 years now. <laughs> and uh, so today he will be interviewed by his most favorite teacher from the <laughs> Wharton School. Uh, so I- It was all graded on a curve. <laughs> yes, I remember uh, Dick mentioned sweetly that I always remember Keith. Uh, and so Professor Richard Herring is, uh, is a founder of the Wharton Financial Institution Center and he also has been a co-director. And uh, he has published more than 150 articles and books and uh, has been very popular among academic and uh, industry leaders only because he has such unique insights into these various financial and regulatory issues, emerging issues. So, uh, and I have been really enjoyed uh, working with Dick through several conferences that we organized together with the, jointly with the Wharton School. So we are really fortunate to have uh, Controller Keith Noraika and Professor Hearing with us today to discuss emerging issues on fintech. Thanks, Jalapa, for that very generous introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to have a public conversation with Keith. Um, one of the great pleasures of teaching at Wharton is that you occasionally have some truly brilliant students. And even better, sometimes you can convince them to be research assistants. Keith was one of each and provided invaluable help in putting together uh, a book that uh, Brookings published. Brookings, for those of you who have been through the ordeal, has this incredibly demanding fact-checking uh, facility, and, and Keith, thank goodness, was able to <laughs> get all of my facts in order, which is something I was, but it was characteristic of the methodical way he approaches everything. So uh, I, it's a special pleasure to be able to ask him about what's happening in the controller's office with regard to uh, FinTech and financial innovations more generally. Um, Keith, we often think about FinTech as something altogether new, but in fact, the controller has really been on the cutting edge of financial innovations really since its founding. You could argue that um, one of the reasons it was founded was to introduce a national currency, which uh, they certainly carried off, but over time, 
they've often been one of the agencies most interested in trying to foster innovation and create a regulatory framework that makes sense in terms of advancing both uh, the services that people can enjoy, but also the safe and sound provision of services. Is this really different or is it more of the same? Well, um, that's a great question. And, and basically, I think the answer is it's both. Um, and trying to have it both ways since I'm from Washington, I suppose. But uh, look, I think that, as you noted, the, the business of banking itself is an organic uh, concept. It's uh, a statutory term obviously used in the National Bank Act, uh, but the Supreme Court has recognized over the past 150 years, uh, basically acknowledging it's a dynamic marketplace that um, the OCC regulates that the business of banking itself evolves over time. Um, and we've certainly seen that, as you noted, uh, in the sense of the, the whole purpose for the National Bank Act in the first place was to establish a national currency. Um, that actually gave rise to uh, other financial innovations at the time, trying to put the state bank notes out of existence. It caused the emergence of something known as the checking account, which we all have today, a book entry type system. As evolved over time, certainly, uh, you see historically now we can look back and see there were uh, issues that came up as banks got into say things like data processing, uh, automated teller machines, the so-called internet banks that when I first got to, got to Washington. So the way I look at um, technology and banking is technology has always been part of banking. It's just I think what we may be seeing at this particular moment is sort of an exponential disruption in the market, and I think that's why we're all, frankly, here today, uh, is to talk about that and, and how it um, you know, comports with the business of banking. But I think you've put your finger exactly on the, the button of that it is part and parcel of the business of banking itself. There is basically new ways of doing that very old business of taking deposits, making loans, and paying checks, and those are the three core elements and they you know, sometimes exist independent of one another, but that is the core of the business of banking. And, and as such, I guess I tend to think of this area as yet another form of shadow banking. Mm -hmm. And like much of shadow banking, it tends to thrive because uh, it's possible to do these bank-like functions in a organizational structure that is less expensive because it's not subject to regulation. Now, there are other advantages too, such as applications of technology and so forth, but it seems to have that in common with shadow banking. So I guess the question that occurred to me as I was thinking about the discussion around a fintech charter from the OCC is what is the advantage to a fintech company to get a national charter? They have a number of, of alternatives, some of which they're using a lot of today, uh, there's always a state chartered bank. I'm not aware that there's anyone doing it, but it certainly could happen. Uh, there are sort of ILCs and other kinds of special agencies. A lot of partnerships going on already. Uh, what would be the advantage of having a national charter from the OCC? Well, I think, uh, look, I think these are topics that really, when you look historically back, are topics that, that you know, even we had discussed when I was at Wharton in the <laughs> sense that there's always been a pressure, I think, of the, in the banking system or back in the days we were talking about disintermediation and things like that on the funding side. Um, I think what a lot of people see of the advantage of being in the banking system, especially with the national charter, and this has historically been the case, is that there's a uniform system of regulation across a federal system. Uh, you have one regulator and you're subject to basically one uniform set of rules. Um, and in particular, for those that want to lend, um, there is the ability to use one state's interest rate, your home state or main office interest rate, uh, across the various states uh, without regard uh, to, the, um, to the usury laws of the various states. And that's per a you know, unanimous Supreme Court case of about 40 some years ago, actually probably about 40 years ago uh, now. And so I think the advantage if there, if there is one, now obviously there are costs too and we can talk about those, um, would be that uniform set of rules. Now the, the you know, inherent in the nature of the, the activity that's being undertaken is it will be subject to some regulation regardless of whether it happens 
in the banking system. So that's a, maybe another way of saying what I was just saying, but in a more granular way of if it's not in a national bank, then it clearly will be subject to presumably state regulation as well as regulation by the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, now, I think as it comes into the bank, depending on whether the bank takes uh, a national bank, depending on whether the national bank takes deposits, it may still be subject to the regulation by the CFPB, but may not if, it, if it's a deposit-taking entity under $10 billion. That's a certain tw quirk of Dodd-Frank, but that, that's sort of the lay of the land. So you, if you bring it sort of, if you do a fintech-type activity that, doesn't, that does take deposits, you wouldn't be subject to CFPB jurisdiction, but if you didn't, um, then, then you may still have the dual regulation of, of the OCC and the CFPB doing a, a fintech charter. I know even as a student, you're always interested in the quantitative impacts of regulation. And I understand you've been um, overseeing a study on the impact of, of one of the CFPB's rulings on um, uh, ruling out arbitration. This, I think, would have impact, or at least interest, to fintech companies, which probably would fall under it. What, what have you found in the study? Well, I mean, that, that is a good question. I mean, I think what originally caught my eye of the CFPB's uh, rule banning arbitration clauses for class action uh, type exposure, but not for individual exposure, oddly, um, was that the potential impact that may have on small institutions, including small uh, financial technology companies uh, that really may face a massive litigation exposure. So that obviously gave uh, rise to my interest of being a member of the, the FSOC uh, committee that regulates for st systemic risk. And it's certainly something I heard a, a lot about from, from community bankers. And you do know uh, firsthand litigation costs. Well, right that's there. true, yeah. So, so, so you know, I, I had a sort of back and forth with the director of the CFPB and graciously, after a few letters, he, he finally uh, agreed to share with me their data. And we have now um, completed our study uh, of their data. And interestingly, um, what it really does show is the massive effect that, that their rule will have, uh, likely economically significant effect their rule will have uh, on consumers um, who will be subject uh, to this, this rule and, and be, have to forego uh, being able to uh, use arbitration uh, where there, there could be a class action. And what we found is that there could be as high as a 3.5% annual percentage rate increase for these type of um, these consumers who, who would be subject to the rule. In the this would be 350 basis points above? Yeah. On the APR. So that, you know, on the average APR nowadays, that's like a 25% increase uh, in credit costs for people who may live week to week. Um, clearly, that's part of the data that we saw that wasn't disclosed um, in, in the data they had. So that, that, I think, again, gives real concerns, not only with respect to the potential safety and soundness impacts that uh, that rule may have on banks, but there's also a real tangible economic effect that it may have on consumers, especially those who live week to week imposed by this rule, um, um, you know that that wasn't disclosed in the in the CFPB study. So. And it's another example of that most robust of economic laws, the law of unintended consequences. Well, I mean, I guess I look at it as if somebody is trying to say, you know, you, you can't look after your own interest. You should look out for what they, you know, what what interest it benefits them, or you know, what they're not telling you about it. And that's sort of the way I approach that study. And and that's what you know. That's the result we found. Uh, and it concerns me certainly a lot uh, as, as somebody who regulates banks and tries to have fair access to credit for consumers. We are very much focused today on, on what's happening here in the U.S. with regard to fintech, but it's certainly not the only place it's happening. It's a global trend. In fact, it may be even more advanced in China than, than here. Uh, but some countries seem to have been much more proactive in thinking about the right kind of regulatory framework. I'm thinking in particular of the European Central Bank and most especially the Bank of England that's created a sort of regulatory sandbox where um, they're willing to give people a more liberal set of, of rules to operate within but under close scrutiny so that both the regulator and the firms can sort of learn how to do business in a safe and sound way. Why is it so hard to do that in the United States? 
Well, it's hard to do. Like, first of all, I'm very supportive of that notion. I think that for technology to um, really incubate, it cannot be subject to draconian potential legal liability. And I've been very supportive of what we would call a pilot program. I know other people use the term sandbox where um, you know, regulators can come in and see how technology interfaces um, with, um, with the financial system, with consumers, um, and, and trying to um, limit liability attached to that or potential liability. I think the hardest part, again, having potentially been a lawyer in the private sector, is that no one regulator has abs abs uh, can absolve uh, an actor who wants to engage in these type of things of all potential liability because the liability accrues from different regulatory agencies. Yeah. So a lot of the type of technologies would actually be consumer facing. That again comes back to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I can't, um, as the comptroller of the currency or acting comptroller of the currency, uh, be able to absolve a technology company that wants to get in there and try these things out of the various consumer facing laws. And obviously, you know, laws, um, you know, rules like this arbitration clause make it even harder um, for, for those type of, uh, um, you know, innovation to occur. Yeah, uh, the unified regulatory system the British have adopted does facilitate this, but I think the objective rings true for the U.S. as well. Both the ECB and the Bank of England have explicitly stated this kind of approach as a way of fostering competition. Right. And one of the characteristics of the U.S. system after the, the great financial crisis is we really haven't had much bank entry. There's yeah. not a lot going on that would sort of increase competition except from the fintech sector. Well, a lot of that has to do with the uh, sort of incredibly slow pace of the FDIC in granting de novo deposit insurance. It's a monopoly, and clearly when you're in the insurer, all you see is risk attached to it. They've just been through the financial crisis, but the numbers are very low, and I'm, uh, I actually sit on the FDIC board uh, as a member, as the acting comptroller of the currency. And, um, you know, really, there have just been a handful. I mean, I probably get it on one hand, uh, the number that have been approved since the financial crisis. Maybe we'll get up to two hands uh, in the next year or two. But it's nothing like the rate at which uh, we had seen um, in prior years, uh, prior to the financial crisis. And look, I understand um, that as you're, you know, sort of moving through a financial crisis, there's a lot of excess capacity. And we've seen a lot of consolidation, and we continue to see a lot of consolidation. I think the unique thing that we don't see at the moment that we have seen in prior business cycles is, as you said, the lack of entry. So we really are um, constrained because of that one gating point in the law of inability to get deposit insurance for de novo institutions uh, to these specialty charters. Now look, there are other types of specialty charters beside a fintech charter. There are um, you know, other type of banks I know we've discussed at points like a trust bank and, and the like that we can charter uh, without deposit insurance. But uh, yeah, you have really quite a nice set of options. We do. Fact. <laughs> and some of the special charters, which are well recognized, could well fit some kinds of fintech models. That's right. Uh, as I understand it, you've been holding office hours in San Francisco and New York talking with companies that may be interested. I'm sure we that's a very interesting. Our, our chief innovation officer, Beth Knickerbocker, is sitting right in the, in the front row, and, and she uh, has been leading this effort. And really, the response has been quite overwhelming. And I think the notion of having an office of innovation at the office of the comptroller of the currency, um, you know, it's, it, it seems very novel and revolutionary until you realize you can't imagine life without it, yeah. um, because it really is just a necessary part uh, of the business of banking now. And, you know, one of the things when I first came, I had the same reaction. I mean, I've been around the banking laws for 20, 25 years. Um, a number of the laws, you know, probably were enacted when, when I was working for you and, and now seem, you know, fair, fairly established. But you often will see like, oh, there's this type of charter, like a trust bank charter, and that may have, 
you know, been originally designed for a certain purpose, but now uh, in the era of technology with virtual currencies and things like that, you can imagine that type of entity, you know, being the repository for the central ledger or something like that where um, certainly um, things that we hadn't seen in the past. And I think the challenge for the regulators, not only the OCC, but even the other federal regulators is we have to apply our statutory factors in new ways. And that's, I think, as you said, always been sort of inherent in the mission of the OCC because it's sort of grown up with the culture and the nature of our organic statutes. I think for some of the other agencies, um, you know, it's, it's um, they just have to, it, 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 these aren't things they've seen before, right? And so there has to be sort of a comfort level uh, developed in novel situations. And, and so that's sort of um, really a necessary part of the evolution of banking. And, and uh, our challenge on the regulatory front where we aren't subject to market forces necessarily is to keep up. Yeah, and I suppose another complication of, of doing this in the U.S. is that other regulators do have the option of, of suing to prevent you from acting, uh, as uh, I guess is more than a theoretical possibility in this case. Um, how, how does that affect your strategy for dealing with it? How, how can you cope with this whole welter of regulation that we've got? You understand the thicket better than most people, but it is complicated. Um, it's complicated. It, look, it doesn't deter me personally. I sympathize with your comment because I may not be a usual person in the sense of I know what the thicket is, I know how it works, and you know, being a defendant in a law lawsuit doesn't scare me uh, because I'm fairly confident um, of where the agency is on the merits of that case. Um, and so to me, that's what you do in a organized society. You have disputes, you settle them um, through legal action, um, and then you move on. And it's certainly uh, a right I have exercised on behalf of my clients in private practice. And if the states want to do that, and they certainly should, and they have in the past. Um, and you know, for the most part, the track record speaks for itself. Um, and I think it will uh, again in the future. So I think... Um, it does slow things down, though, it, in dealing it with their rapidly down, but changing Look, yeah, I think in, in our society, I mean, as we see, we enjoy all the freedoms that we have in this country. I think a lot of that has to do with uh, that it, it's hard to get things done at the government level. And that, to me, is not necessarily a bad thing because it allows innovators like you uh, to create uh, within the interstices of of those, um, uh, of those regulatory overlap. Now, it's really hard um, when you're on the inside, as I can yeah. tell you, to try to, to interface. But that is, the, in my view, the price that we pay uh, for, for a free society. And I think, to me, where we start to have the, the issues come up in the banking system is where we do have what I would call a regulatory monopoly. So you, know, you see that with the deposit insurance now. It's, it's a problem because you have to get deposit insurance to take deposits under the, when you piece all the various laws together, there's not an option. There used to be in the past, not anymore for the most part. Um, same thing starts to happen at the bank holding company level, although I try to be respectful being at the Federal Reserve <laughs> Bank of Philadelphia. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, we can go there in a minute, but I think one of the things you pointed out, <laughs> since we are here after all, <laughs> is that um, regulatory arbitrage is not necessarily a negative thing it actually can, can press for some very useful innovations and changes. And it does present, I think, a very useful pressure at times for the regulatory agencies to, to think about what's happening in the outside world to try to put together a framework that makes sense for, for preserve, protecting the system. Well, I think that's right, because it focuses you as the regulator on the, the what you need to get done, what is, and look, there will be times that, I mean, we see this where banks will want to change their, the, you know, some of the smaller banks will want to change their charter to a state charter to, because the state is easier at regulating them. And my view is that's not negotiable. I mean, there's a, there's a reputation to being a national bank that's non-negotiable and, you know, be that as it may. And I think for the most part, it works to our advantage there is that sort of notion. But 
I think, again, that also then comes back to the fintech discussion in my mind of we have sort of a framework to charter non-depository fintech institutions, and this is the subject of the, the lawsuit. And the reason why we think that lawsuit isn't you know, yet ripe for review is because we have to make sure a technology company is ready to be a bank. We have very high standards at the OCC for regulating what a bank is. We have expectation of success. And so I worry when you talk about the FinTech, the tech part uh, may have a you know more entrepreneurial view of maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. And I think that's where what is taking us a while to get our hands around is setting the regulatory expectations of coming together um, where um, we would be comfortable regulating one of these institutions as a bank with them you know, buying into what it means to be a bank with all the benefits and burdens uh, of that type of commitment. And surely one of the huge benefits of getting a national charter is a reputational benefit. It does convey a certain standard that isn't necessarily true in, in other areas. Well, I hope so, and that's certainly something we've tried to keep up for the past 154 years, and you know, certainly as long as I'm there, and I can imagine with my successor, that, you know, again, will mean a lot, that that's why we're going slow and, and really kicking the tires with this, uh, is to make sure that there is a goodness of fit um, when we proceed, right. if we proceed. But since we are sitting here in the Fed, I yes. guess we really should talk about <laughs> another sort of constraint that fintech companies Let often worry about. Let me look for the about. exits. Yeah, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> there's one there and there. I think there's a back door here if we're really quick. Um, one of the issues, of course, is that fintech firms are not banks. Mm -hmm. And to become a bank, at least in the world of the Federal Reserve, um, you need to be part of a bank holding company, and a bank holding company cannot do other commercial things. That's a real issue that um, is difficult to, neg to navigate. Uh, we've talked about, I think this was a big topic even when you were taking my course 25 years ago or so, um, and it doesn't seem to have changed much. The Fed sort of is a matter of theology, wants an absolute wall between banking and commerce, but FinTech is not evolving in that way. It's true there's a lot of partnership, a lot of banks are doing FinTech inside, but a lot of the major firms are not banks and probably don't feel like they want to be banks. Well, I, I look, I think you have to sort of unpack that uh, in the sense of what we're really talking about is what constitutes a bank legally under the Bank Holding Company Act. And that's what we were sort of talking about a little bit earlier is there may be and there are banks out there that are not banks for purposes of the Bank Holding Company Act that look and feel and do the business of banking. You know, traditionally the thrifts are not banks under the Bank Holding Company Act. Thrifts may be the, the biggest example. They have their own holding company uh, type regime. Um, the um, trust banks, the credit card banks, the bankers banks, um, and then special purpose. Um, charters as well. And those are all viewed nowadays as exceptions to the wall of the banking and commerce. But, you know, as we, maybe it was more in vogue 25 years ago when it was even more novel, but this is, first, it's a very uniquely American concept. This is not something you see in any country in the world. So you always have to ask yourself, you know, are we doing the right thing? And I ask myself that every day about everything. Um, so it wouldn't be um, surprising on, on big things like that where everyone's kind of marching in a different direction. Is this the right way to go? It may be the right way to go, but I think we have to have a discussion about it. The second thing is it's very, no, it's very new in the history of our country. So it wasn't until 1956 that the Bank Holding Company Act even existed. Um, and then it was only put in place for not the best of reasons. It was a way to, to squelch competition. And then it wasn't until 1970, two years before I was born, that, they, that a, you could have more than, so, so at 1956, the restrictions on banking and commerce only applied to a multi-bank holding company. It was, it was, a, it was meant, enacted as a way to get at a certain banker who had more than one bank, say, in California or someplace. It might be in San Francisco. And um, it wasn't until 1970 that those restrictions were then applied to single bank holding companies. And it wasn't until 1999 
that those restrictions were fully um, fully applied to um, to, to um, uh, thrift institutions. So it's you know 1999 isn't that long ago. I mean, it's not even 20 years ago yet. Um, and yet, um, for whatever reason, over the past 10, 15 years, um, it has you know almost become, as you said. Uh, a type of um, you know sort of religious devotion of this is the way it always is, and there are sort of are exceptions or cracks in the wall of banking and commerce. What I sort of wanted to do um, during my acting uh, role here is get the conversation started a little. We used to have these conversations, and they were some of the most fascinating conversations that I can remember. And I had them at Wharton, I had them at Harvard Law School, um, and there are incredibly good arguments on both sides. Um, that need to be discussed. And I think as we start seeing, as you said, FinTech is the latest venue where this is to be approached because if you are a financial technology company, yeah, you probably aren't gonna wanna have to sign up to become um, a bank holding company with all the burdens of that and restrict your other activities um, that may not be banking enough like for purposes of the Federal Reserve Board. And there is a, what always struck me as this debate sort of petered away during the financial crisis is two things. First, the, um, the unitary thrifts actually you know, were more diversified during the financial crisis and did a little bit better because their, all their eggs weren't in, in one basket. And I think one fascinating thing to be done um, you know, either by our economics department or the Fed's economics department or, or someone at Wharton would be um, to, to sort of track the, the financial performance through the, you know, the worst financial crisis and see how these companies did. Because I can think of a couple that it was pretty good. They had a big industrial company sitting with them because they were more diversified. The second thing that always struck me um, as I grew up um, on the other side um, in, in the private sector was the amount of resources that the government spent policing this line. And it got to the point where, um, you know, the Federal Reserve, it's, it, it, it almost was like a missile in church, right? Like you had to look and if, if a company owned 34% of the equity of a bank, they were a bank holding company. Well, you know, there were a lot of banks failing in the financial crisis and someone wanted to bail them out. And if you could only make the deal structure work by having 34%, the Fed, you know, would often say, too bad, you know, either you become a bank holding company or the bank fails. And what was the social cost of that? Who, who really cares other than, I mean, maybe the people in this building. Uh, and, and, and to me, that gave rise to, there was a lot, and there were a lot of people, some of them may actually work for me now, uh, who, who, who were employed uh, to police that line. And to me, maybe those resources would have been better spent on, you know, building new bridges or new roads or, or, or some other uh, productive in, endeavor for, for the country um, than um, something that really we weren't even sure was a good thing in the first place. So I think you are seeing it again in the financial technology. Now to me, financial technology is even more, even if you accept some limitations on banking and commerce, I mean, financial technology is sort of interwound with the business of banking itself. It's just that the restrictions on affiliations start to strangle um, that innovation because they are so rigid um, that they cannot, for the most part, accommodate um, you know, the, the sort of dynamic nature of the technological, te technological marriage with, with, with business of banking. Would the carve out for the special purpose charters um, actually provide an answer to that? Well, it wouldn't be a bank for purposes of the Bank Holding Company Act, and it wouldn't necessarily need to get FDIC insurance. So it could, um, you know, if that's the way we would decide to go, um, have sort of immediate, um, you know, it would be regulatorily streamlined just by the nature or definition of the entity. So it, it wouldn't necessarily um, have to uh, be regulated as a bank holding company. It wouldn't be subject to those affiliation restrictions, um, and that also it wouldn't necessarily have to, to wait in the long queue to get FDIC insurance either. Uh, I guess that's probably sufficiently controversial, though it, it would be a good time to open the discussion to the audience. Does anybody want to uh, ask a question about the sort of general topics we have 
uh, talked about or something more particular to I am a lawyer, so you can ask me any yeah. question you yeah, want, I, I and I will answer it as a lawyer. I can attest to the fact that Keith answer is, at all, so. no, he's, <laughs> he's very quick on his feet. Uh, McCool. There was a news reports recently about Barclays, Banco Santander, USB, uh, and some other large banks are collaborating to form, uh, to create digital currencies. And since you are the acting controller of the currency, uh, what is your view of this phenomenon? And if, if this were to happen in the US, how would you regulate it? Well, um, that's a good question. I think the joke on the way up here was we were putting the currency back in, uh, in, in control of the <laughs> currency. So just historically, um, you know, the, the, the office, our office was created to facilitate a national currency. That currency part uh, of our function was superseded when the Federal Reserve Act came into place in 1913. Um, look, I am of a person of, um, I want to see, um, I am open to seeing what the benefits of these type of financial innovations are. Um, and certainly, as they start to come into our regulated sphere, we want to understand them and get on top of all the risks and really know what they are to see if they do present a systemic risk to the financial system as well as you know, other uh, potential risks to uh, consumers and sort of a fair access to the banking system. On the other hand, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I'm not going to sort of get out there and say don't try innovation, especially even in the currency sphere, because you know the government doesn't always have a monopoly on good ideas, even potentially um, the idea of what constitutes value and the transfer of value. But I think these are things we, as regulators, really have to understand and then form a view on um, how we regulate it and the risks associated with it. Yes. Earlier today we had a and you touched on this, a fascinating set of papers on regulatory arbitrage, and it was particularly focused on the mortgage uh, area. My question is, to what extent are you focused uh, on the regulatory arbitrage in the payment space? And in particular, uh, the, the question comes about because you have an originating bank and a receiving bank, both with tremendous burdens for BSA, AML, know your customer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the risk and tremendous costs, but the juice comes from the movement of the money from one to the other, and the fintechs that step into that space don't have any regulatory framework at all. So to what extent is that a concern for you, and how do you think about that from a policy perspective? Well, look, I think in the um, you know, sort of national security law enforcement context of BSA AML, I mean, I, I, I probably would dispute the premise of the fintech company that comes in doesn't have any obligations because they may have obligations they don't even know about because they would be potentially subject to regulation under those laws by the Treasury. Um, but um, look, I think um, I, 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 I can't imagine um, knowing those laws that that could easily be arbitrage given the heavy risk associated with those payments. My own view of those laws is um, not necessarily, um, is more to focus on, um, I, I think um, we want to take away the incentive of if there is an incentive to arbitrage them uh, by um, recalibrating them uh, to make them more efficient and effective. Because I think, look, the normal banker, the normal person participating in the payment system realizes they have to do their part um, in, you know, stopping terrorism. If they don't know that, then they probably need to know that uh, from someone like me in my position or, or the Treasury or the Justice Department. Um, but, but I think the real problem we're seeing with the BSA AML framework these days is it um, it has become sort of layered on and on and on and not rationalized. And so I think I wouldn't want to give people the incentive to do the type of thing you were talking about uh, just because it becomes so onerous and hard to deal with um, that 
it, it, it doesn't make any sense to people anymore. And I, I guess, again, sort of what I'm pushing the industry to do is to get to a part where they talk to the other stakeholders with national security and law enforcement about, you know, are we really doing what we need to do to combat a dynamic threat in the marketplace as opposed to checking a lot of boxes dealing with past threats? And so there will be, I think there needs to be sort of a rationalization of that regulatory regime. Um, and, and I think then that is a place where you need a level playing field for all the participants, uh, but in a way that doesn't disadvantage. Like what we see now is you can't lower um, the BSA AML threshold for the smallest banks because all the risk will run there. So as it starts to become more and more expensive, it becomes like a gating item to participate in the market. And my own view, again, um, having been around this, is we haven't taken a sort of step back approach in the 40 years the Bank Secrecy Act has been enacted and the rules that have come through. I mean, for instance, the CTR limit has not been increased uh, probably since I've been alive. Um, and, and that tells you something. And I understand there are people who don't want it increased, and I understand why, but they need to understand what the costs are uh, for things that they want to do. What, what the sort of value proposition is in, is it in, is in it for them um, in the sense of um, there could be resources freed up to, for banks to be looking for, for dynamic threats. So I think, um, again, I think, I don't know whether the premise of your question was quite right. And if certainly if that's the way people are looking at it, um, they, there's a lot of potential liability associated uh, with BSA AML um, and, and that sort of a risk being introduced to the system, but my guess is will be found uh, and, and have heavy penalties associated with it. But I think overall what I'm seeing from that system is that it sort of needs to be recalibrated to make it more efficient and effective so there are sort of less incentives to do those type of things. It, that raises a, another point in my mind about uh, a, a trend in bank supervision and regulation. That, that emphasizes bank oversight of all of their vendors. And I'm wondering how that reaches the, the, the huge number of partnerships we see between fintech entities and banking firms. Are we in fact getting sort of um, regulation at, at second hand by regulating banks that then have responsibility for looking at a lot of the operational risks and cyber risks in their vendors? Yeah, and, and the answer to that uh, is yes, that's inherent in the the system of uh, our regulation of banks includes a regulation of their service providers as well. That's in a, in a statute called the Bank Service Company Act. Um, and there is there are provisions, so just in case you're partnering up with a bank so you know, um, that allow the bank regulators, notwithstanding the contractual provisions of the relationship, to come in and examine the services those providers provide to banks. Now, I think what we are also doing, there has been a push uh, from the Federal Reserve, the OCC, the other bank regulators, is to really highlight the risks um, to the, the regulated banking organization of doing business with third-party service providers and to really account for all of those risks. And it could be cyber breaches. It could be non-providing, not providing the service and what your plan is to deal with it. Um, it, you know, other type of breaches in the contract, risks that may develop, and for the institution to have a plan to deal with those risks. So our supervision and the other banking uh, regulator supervision is risk-based, and we want the banks to have a plan to deal with the potential risks. As you're introducing a third party, you're obviously having some risks of it's outside your risk governance structure, and to have a, we really, um, sort of are pushing our institutions to have a, a framework to deal with that risk uh, of the third party, presented by the third yeah. party. Yeah, my impression in talking to, to bank risk managers is that's becoming a heavier and heavier obligation. Uh, and some of them even rethinking whether you want to insource because it's just too difficult. Yeah. Uh, which and look, we're, we're very mindful and certainly, um, you know, when I come in sort of from a change in administration as we sort of look back at the financial crisis 10 years after the financial crisis, seven years after Dodd-Frank, we are very mindful of regulatory burden. We want it to be calibrated to 
the risks presented in the financial system. Now, there is a particular risk introduced by third-party service providers that I think we need to be mindful of, but you know, nothing comes without cost is what you're saying, and I think we want to be mindful of only doing it to the extent that there is benefit or marginal benefit so we're not overdoing it so that there can't be these partnerships, especially um, you know, in, in the dynamic realm of technology. This question is perhaps, oh, please, go ahead. Uh, Michael at Coindesk here. Um, next on stage is a bunch of um, papers being presented uh, regarding blockchain and cryptocurrencies. I'm, I'm just curious if you see the current regulatory conditions um, uh, suitable for a, a Bitcoin or cryptocurrency company ever being given a fintech charter or if that's something that's never going to happen. Um, how do I answer that one? I think you already said blockchain possibly could There work. you go. All right, there you go. He's helping me out. So look, I think I don't want to comment on anyone's business plan. I think those people should come talk to us, but there are office you know, I don't hours, wanna, remember. There are office hours, but I don't and maybe we'll have some in Philadelphia after this. Uh, but I don't want to sort of I think my answer to the notion of of these type of um, you know, experimentation from the earlier question said that I'm not you know, totally against them in the first place. So if I wasn't totally against them in the first place, you know, I wouldn't be adverse to those people coming in and talking to the OCC about how a charter could make sense for them. But look, that is a long process that you have to go through. And just because you get in the door doesn't mean you get out the door on the other side uh, with the charter. But I, I would never, I mean, certainly I don't think it's my position as a government official ever to say no to any innovative idea of any American that wants to come in uh, and petition their government for a, a benefit from the government. I think our role is to hear them out and hear their best arguments and see if it makes sense under what our statutory obligations are. Uh, you know, no more, no less than that. Keith, may I finish with uh, it's sort of unfair question, given that you've only been in office for, what is it, six months now? <laughs> Five months. <laughs> the um, problem of, of thinking about the risks of the whole system has sort of been placed with the Financial Services Oversight Council. Uh, you're a member of that council. Um, some people worry that it is incredibly dysfunctional. Yep. Don't worry. <laughs> we have backup for that. One of their members drops their <laughs> drink on the ground. Yeah. Um, the, um, that it's a mix of responsibilities, statutory mandates, powers that are really very different agency to agency. Each one sort of has views that depends on what they're sitting on and that it's very difficult to for the, the regulators to take a system-wide view. Um, I, and this is an unfair question, but I am curious, since you're a very thoughtful observer, how does it seem to be working when you're actually part of the mix? Well, look, I think um, the, the FSOC has many valuable roles to play in the sense of it is a forum that allows the various regulators to come together. There are certain statutory coordinating functions given to the council and to the, the chair of the council um, to help you know, identify various systemic risks that may cut across industries, say with activities, um, to, to coordinate the activities in response by the member agencies um, within the agencies um, within their, their area. I think, the, to me, the, the, the hardest or most problematic part of that council is the notion of the designation of the specific entities uh, because to me that's just basically pulling one you know one unfortunate company out from a competitive industry mm -hmm. and marking them with an additional burden and that can be you know there are in a lot of inherent risks with that sort of politically um, of picking winners and losers and if you're well connected you may do well if you're not you're a loser you're a loser if you're a winner you're a winner and the government picks that rather than the marketplace. So to me, it's better if you don't like a certain activity, Congress should legislate and say they're subject to this type of heightened regulation, and then everyone has to deal with it, and they can order their affairs uh, appropriately. But it's not like you just get into some business, and then all of a sudden the government comes knocking on your door saying, wait a minute, 
we're going to hijack your company and you know make you change your entire business line and if you don't you're out of business that that to me is not not good government um, and I guess the bottom line question for me is should I sleep better at night with regard to systemic risk because we have FSOC in place rather than the prior president's working group? Yeah. Is it more effective, do you think, in, in looking at, at potential threats and, and trying to uh, coordinate a reasonable response? I think the good part of it is it provides statutory governance over what the president's working group was. So there, a lot of times what you will find when you are a government official um, you know, who takes an oath to uphold the law um, is you will you know, find a good policy, say, to you know, share your confidential supervisory information, but you can't because you're legally constrained. Or, or, but this, the, the, the general notion uh, of a body like FSOC is it does provide governance uh, structure where the different agencies can come together and coordinate. So I think in that way it is, it is a positive uh, development and, and does further uh, the financial stability of the United States. Great. Well, I see we've run to the end of our allotted time. So please join me in thanking Keith for an exceptionally candid conversation. Thank you very much.